Good morning, everybody. Hey, isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Before we start, look at somebody and tell them that you love them this morning. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. I love you too. Hey, it's good to see you here. I hope it is well with your soul. Isn't it, a, isn't it an awesome privilege to be able to sing and praise a holy God? Amen, isn't it? It just, it really is. You know, I look around and I see so many people who have been so very blessed. Some of you have been blessed with great minds. Some of you have been blessed with great attitudes. And some of you, like me, have just been blessed with great looks, okay? I mean, listen, that's just... I mean, listen, most of us aren't going to have all three, right? But, but at least I got one, okay? I got one. Hey, it's so good to be in God's house, to be able to worship together. And I will say, uh, the, the, the music this morning, it is well, I hope, I so hope it's well with your soul this morning. I, I really, really do. If you would join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 17. What it takes to do the impossible in your life is what we will be talking about this morning. You know, most of us have run into things that seem to be pretty impossible, seem to be a little out of our comfort zone or our abilities. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, just for a few moments. Father God, we praise you. Lord, what a holy and awesome God you are. Thank you for letting us be here. To worship you, Lord, this is all about you. The songs we sing, they're to you. The, the very praise on our lips, they're for you. And Lord, I thank you that, that we can come and worship you knowing that you love us and that you care for us and that you are our healer and our protector. You are our guide. Lord, you're our comfort. And so, Lord, we just praise you now as we... As we look at the word you've given us, that it wouldn't be just the words on a sheet, but they would be embedded in our heart. Well, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I was reminded this past week of something that I knew, but that I had stored away somewhere in my mind and I could not find it. Have you ever stored something away in your mind and could not find it? How many of you store something away every day and you can't find it? You know, it, it, it gets lost in those old files I have up there in my mind. You know, there's some crates. Because see, I grew up in the day where everything was on paper. And so in my mind, I guess there's these boxes that's got a little dust on them. How many of y'all have a little dust up there in the attic? Anybody have a little of those? You know, I'm, I'm reminded because I've kind of stored some things uh, it, it kind of got lost amongst all the activity. And you know, we live such hectic lives now until if we're not careful, some of the things we really do know gets lost up there in the, all the activity. How, how many of you have way too much activity going on in life? Anybody have too much activity? I can help you limit it. I just can't help me limit mine. Okay, listen, I'm just being honest. Sometimes we just, like those old boxes and all those old rolled up papers, we just forget to put labels on the stuff we know and then we can't go back and just find it easily. When my dad died a year or so ago, my brother and I had the, this is going to sound strange, we had the, the joy of going through my dad's shop and stuff. I know that sounds strange, but it was like a treasure hunt. Because my dad was a pack rat. Do y'all know what I'm saying? Do, are y'all like that? My dad would have a brown paper bag rolled up inside another paper bag inside a coffee can. And so when you open the coffee can, you think, this is going to be something important. Dad's left us some treasure here. And so you'd open the coffee can, then you'd open the bag, and you'd take out the other, and there'd be one screw in there. Like, like what, what is that? One screw? He must have had 200 cigarette lighters. 
Who needs 200 cigarette lighters? Only a pyromaniac needs 200 cigarette lighters. Every key to everything that my dad ever owned, he still had. And when he went to find the key to fit something that he had locked, Mike, he couldn't figure out which key it was anymore. We kind of forget some things that we really do know. And, it, and it's, a, it's kind of a, a dangerous place sometimes in my mind. It's kind of scary up there because it gets kind of muddled. Do y'all ever kind of have a muddled mind sometime? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work. How many of you see people at Walmart and you avoid them because you know you don't know their name? Y'all do that? I live in Tarentum. Well, we do. My, we're still married, right? It's a dangerous place. 15 miles to Troy is 20 miles to Ozark. I'm going to Ozark to Walmart because I don't want to see people that I don't know their names. So I'd rather just go not expecting to see anybody I know. Okay? So this is kind of the way this is. This is a reminder for me this week. I was reminded this week that the amount of faith that it takes to do the impossible in my life is really a very small amount indeed. Now, if you're kind of following along with notes, write this down. Little is much when it comes to God. You know, little is much when it comes to God. Amen? Now, if you really believe that, if you believe that God can take a little and make a lot, just say amen like you really mean it. Listen, I see it every day where, where what we come with is so very little, but when God gets through with it, it doesn't even look the same. I'm reminded of how Jesus fed the 5,000. He took a little and He made a lot. He not only made a lot, but He made more than they could think and comprehend. When it comes to God, a little is a lot. God takes that mustard seed faith so if you would join me in Matthew 17, I'm going to start in verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast out this demon? They'd come off the mountain. Boy, everything was exciting. But yet the disciples were running into some difficulties in their life. And you know what? We're all going to have some difficulties in our life, aren't we? We really are. And he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say, now listen, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. God takes the mustard seed faith that we have, and He brings it to this amazing maturity in our lives. Now I've been a Christian a long time, how about you? And every single day I find something new about my Lord I did not know. One of the things that I, I love to think in my mind, and I know I've told you that's a scary place, but I love to think that each new day I appreciate more of what He does in my life. Don't you? Man, how many of you really appreciate what God's doing in your life? Can you say that this morning? So it's that small thing in our faith it's the beginning that's small but it's that powerful maturity that it comes when it counts and see, so that's what we're talking about this morning when we encounter the impossibles the mountains of our lives just like some of you are facing right now now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands but but I want you to kind of internally raise your hands if you're facing some real impossibles in your life, if you're facing some real mountains in your life, just kind of raise that hand up on that inner person that you have because I'm telling you, the person sitting next to you has got a hand raised also. Because we're all going to go through that time in our life where we're just going to seem to have these impossible situations in life. Lord, how am I ever going to do this? How am I ever going to get through this? And that's when we start in earnest, praying about things sometimes. We encounter those impossibles. James reminds us in the book of James that he wrote, he reminds us of a couple of things. First of all, he reminds us that God uses the trials and the everyday testing in our life to help grow our faith. 
It's, it's to help us to get to maturity so that in our faith we have patience and we have endurance. Now, now I, I want to just kind of stop there just for a second and remind you about something. I don't care how closely you walk with Jesus, you're still walking in the world. Somebody say amen. amen. And because we walk in this world, we're going to have troubles and we're going to have difficulties and it's going to be testing. Some of them come when we're young. Some of them come when we're old. And I know young people look around and go, what in the world do old people have to be tested about? Well, you just wait till you get old and you find out. I thought when my children got grown, I'd stop worrying about them. Now I just got more time to worry about them more, don't you? I mean, you know, I'm just being honest. Can you be honest for five minutes? We can find things in life that will challenge us. I am reminded when James said that we are to have that kind of faith that allows us to seek God in confidence without doubting. You know, when we come to worship here, of course, now worship doesn't start here. Worship starts when you open your eyes. Amen? And when the good Lord allows you to take a breath and you stand up. Now, some of you don't stand up like you used to stand up in the mornings. I get that. But that's when worship starts. It doesn't start when you pull into the church at 1 till 11, <laughs> like some of you. Yes, you're that one. That's the one I'm talking about. I saw you laughing. It starts when you get up every day. And so this is the impossible. This is God allowing us to do the impossible without doubting. Do you have the kind of faith to do the impossibles in your life? Because they're coming. The impossibles are coming. If not, then there's hope. You know, I went back through and kind of jotted down some things and then I realized that the disciples went through the same things. I'm reminded of the disciples who were arguing. Have you ever argued with anybody? Just raise your hand if you have. How many of you have argued knowing that you were wrong but you still argued anyway? How many of you argue because you know you're never wrong? Just raise your hand. I'm never wrong. Now just raise your hand if you're sitting beside somebody that always thinks they're right. Okay, Jonathan, gotcha. Listen, the disciples, they were arguing about who would be the greatest. You know, you kind of get the idea that they just really don't have a clue what's fixing to happen in life. They still thought this earthly kingdom was going to exist and they would have an office here and an office here and an office here. One of them would be the commissioner of this and the head of that. They were clueless. Sometimes we're clueless, amen? I'm like Mr. Goo when it comes to preachers. Y'all remember Mr. Goo from years ago? Kind of goes through life kind of blind. He's kind of walking around. I'm reminded of the disciples who were struggling, relying on their own strength. I mean, how many times did the disciples pull at the oars before they realized that it wasn't about what they could do? Jesus was there. So how many times do we pull at the oars trying to get across the lake and then when we run out of strength, Lord, where are you when I need you? I am reminded of Peter, James, and John who were sleeping while Jesus was praying. They were so close. They were the three that got to go into the garden with Jesus. The others had to stay outside. And even though they were the closest, that inner circle, they were still sleeping because they had run into this wall and they were as far as they could go physically. Well, you know what, folks? That's just going to happen sometimes, even being when we know that we've walked with Jesus for a long time. We just go as far as we can go in this flesh. I'm reminded of Peter who was denying. He was weak. And he was aware that something had gone astray in his thinking about Jesus because they were leading Jesus to this place called Calvary. And it was painfully obvious at that time that, that he would not return physically, that he would be crucified. Peter was afraid. I'm reminded of Thomas who was doubting. He was overwhelmed by what true faith is. 
unless I can put my fingers in the holes in his hands and his feet, I will not believe. Some of you right now this morning are struggling with some of the very things that the disciples struggled with as well. Sometimes our faith gets a little overwhelmed by life. But the good news is that while that small mustard seed of faith, it was growing through all those things in their life. Listen to me, church. The mustard seed of faith in your life is growing the same way. Growing to that kind of faith that allowed them to face their impossibles, their mountains. All the disciples died a death that would be glorifying to God, but certainly to the flesh would not be appealing. Some were crucified like Peter upside down. Some were just crucified like Andrew. Some were boiled in oil and spit out on an island like Patmos. Some were stabbed to death. Some were speared to death. Some were just not marked. Like Paul later over it in the life of the church was beheaded by Nero. Listen, all of them glorify God in their death, but certainly not pleasing when it comes to the physical. But that faith, that little seed of faith was growing. Growing and shaping their lives for the sake of the gospel to do the impossible. It was that kind of faith that you share with others that is more precious than gold. Do you have that kind of faith? That mustard seed faith in your life? To do the impossible? I was in a church service with Robin. Be making your way up here, Robin. And I told Robin that I just had to apologize as her pastor. Because when I look at Robin, come on, everybody say, hey Robin. Hey, Robin. When I look at Robin, when, I look, when people look at me, they always laugh, but you don't have to. <laughs> when I look at Robin, I see a young, young lady, little bitty. First time I ever saw Robin, was at UAB after a really terrible car wreck. She laid on the table. (laughs) I was praying over, loving on her like I am now. And to me, she's just, what's the words I'm looking for? She's just fragile. (laughs) But when I heard her give her testimony, I realized that the mustard seed of faith that God gives us isn't dependent on our physical things. It's about faith. It's about the kind of faith that as it grows and matures, you get to share it. And so Robin is going to share her testimony with us this morning. And I have been humbled. Because anybody that can share from her heart what she does, Oh, something's growing there. Something's growing. So, Father God, thank you so much now as Robin comes. Lord, I pray over her. I thank you for her. And I thank you what you've taught me through her. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you turned on? Uh, Thanks. You... <laughs> it's on now? Okay. All right, for y'all that don't know me, I'm Robin Edwards. Uh, I go to Goshen High School, and I look at myself as a miracle of God. Okay, so now it's for the story part. Okay, February 22nd, I was on the way home from Valdosta, Georgia. <laughs> I had been at a drag race. That was my family's thing to do. That's what we love to do. Let's go to the drag races. Um, Anyways, and we had like a 
three-hour trip home, right? So, who doesn't want to sleep when you have a three-hour ride home? I was like, okay, daddy's driving, my uncle's in the front seat, mom and Lacey are in the middle, I'm about to take a nap. So, I lay down and I go to sleep. Next thing I know, I wake up, what, a week later? Right, a week later, in ICU at the hospital in Thomasville. And I had, uh, I was swollen. I knew something wasn't right. And I had all this metal in my mouth and rubber bands had it closed shut. And I was scared. I couldn't talk. I had a tube coming out of my neck. <laughs> and I was truly terrified. It was a moment that I never want to experience again, but I'm glad I did experience it. Because without all of that happening, I wouldn't have been humbled to get to where I am now. Um, I, before the wreck happened, I had been wanting to be saved, and I knew how to go about it, but I didn't know like when or how or why. And I'd been asking or talking to my mom about it, and then one day we were in ICU and my Aunt Carol was in there with me and she, I was ready to go home. I stayed in there like three weeks, but it felt like 10 years. So I was like, I'm ready to get out of here so I can get saved. And she was like, well, you can get saved right now. And I was like, what? Really? Okay. So I got saved. And with the... Injuries I had, every little step forward was something to be completely amazed and grateful for. So every time I did something, whether it was sit up on the bed or take my first step or swallow or not have to get my secretions take care, taken care of, Aunt Carol or Aunt Linda or whoever would sing. <laughs> And we'd sing, it is well with my soul, or how great is our God. It was just stuff like that. And from that point, after I was in the hospital, I got home. And that's when everything really hit. Because I don't remember them telling me that I had lost my dad and my little sister. I still don't remember it. But once I got home, it really hit home. It got to where um, I was waking up in the mornings thinking I was at home, but I wasn't. I was on my aunt's couch because I couldn't go home. And then it was going to school and riding by the elementary school and not dropping my little sister off because she's not here no more. And so I was still like, okay, I need to finish everything. With Even though I got saved in Thomasville, I still need to get baptized at church. So I was at church every Sunday, and I hadn't went up there yet. Well, y'all all know Mama's story, too. She took a brain injury and all way worse than I had. She had to stay in the hospital a lot longer. She stayed in a coma a lot longer. She was eventually moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and she stayed up there for a while, and she had to like learn how to like walk again and all that good stuff. So, at once she became <laughs> outpatient, um, she could come home on the weekends. She could come home Friday afternoon, stay Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, and Sunday till about lunch. And then she'd head back. Well, the first Sunday, <laughs> Mama got to come home. It was all good. And the first weekend or whatever. But she didn't, she didn't want to go to church yet because... It would be over, too overwhelming and all. They told us that she didn't be around big crowds. So it was about what, the second or third Sunday. Mama got to come to church. <laughs> and we walked in the door. And my favorite song, y'all were singing. And it's How Great Is Our God. Well, I start crying like a baby. And <laughs> at the end of the service, I came up here and told Brother Rick I wanted to be saved. And so he's like, all right, in a couple of weeks, you'll get saved or baptized. So I got baptized a couple of weeks later, 
And you're more vulnerable. What are, what are you trying to get at? Everything I've been through, I've been through two wrecks, lost four people. I have had to deal with losing my best friend, which was my daddy, my little sister, which was my mini-me, and my two cousins, Timmy and Blake. And even though I could complain and gripe about this stuff all day, I have so much to be thankful for, and I'm blessed with so much because without all of this happening to me, I, I really don't know where I would be. I'm thankful for it, and I know that sounds crazy, but I am because God has blessed me with so much since February 22nd. I mean, from being able to get back home with my mama and my mama being well and being able to go back to school and all this, he's blessed me with even more. Like, <laughs> I had people that, I mean, yeah, I was close to, but we became closer. <laughs> and then people I used to be close to in elementary school when I was little, and then we didn't talk for a while. We got close again, and he's just blessed me with a bunch of people that I really don't know where I'd be without. But really, I guess, where I'm coming from with all this is no matter what you're facing or what you're going through, whether it be, okay, maybe you're doing bad in school, or either you just lost one of your friends, or you hear there's rumors going around about you at school, or anything, it could be this big to you or this big. You're going to make it through. Just pray about it. God will bring you through it. it I mean, and I know it sounds crazy because people were like, or I know I, when I first got saved, I was like, well, can I pray about that? Or am I supposed to pray about that? I don't, I don't know if you're supposed to pray about that kind of stuff. So I, mean, I pray about it anyways. And the blessings just kept coming and kept coming. But I just want all of y'all to know, whether you know me or not, y'all now know my story. So just know whatever you're going through, that if you pray about it and talk to God about it, He'll bring you through it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's faith. That is the remarkable and amazing work of faith. It doesn't matter how small it starts. It's how powerful it is when it counts. And that's counted. Everything that's true about Robin's life is also true about our lives. And so I'm going to ask Tim to come. And we're going to open the altar. And listen, the altar is open for you to come and pray. Find a friend to come and pray with. There's not a single person in this room, now or later, that won't go through trials. And what Robin said is so very true, the blessings just keep coming. So it, it is in the people that you see and the prayer life that we have that we come before a holy God. So would you stand with me, please?